All right, so as the title slide here says, we're gonna talk about using some lessons learned uh, while working with Joomla to create updatable Symfony applications. Uh, if the title hasn't given it away already, this isn't going to be a Joomla-based talk. So if the thought of, so if the thought of working with non-Joomla code scares the ever-living crap out of you, go ahead and leave. <laughs> you would. So this is the only marketing pitch you're going to get. Ironically, this is for a marketing automation platform. Uh, the software that I'm going to be talking about, it's called Modic. Uh, it's a platform that I've been uh, working with a team uh, with the company that I'm working at to uh, develop. Uh, and we use a similar type of distribution model um, to what Joomla uses for our installer and update paths. Uh, so it kind of made sense to kind of use some of the knowledge that we've gained uh, working with Joomla uh, in building out our own stuff. Um, so if it's not clear already, I've been contributing to Joomla and to Modic for quite a few years, Joomla since 2010. Uh, Modic we started development on last year uh, with its first stable release earlier this year. Uh, if you don't recognize me, you might know me as the angry guy on Twitter. I'm known for ranting a lot and having a lot of opinions. <laughs> So we're, we're focusing very specifically on uh, a small aspect of the overall product. Uh, I'm not here to sell the product to you. I'm here to talk about some technical details and things that we can learn working with open source communities and open source software to improve other open source software and open source communities. So very specifically, we're, we're looking at how we can use uh, how Joomla and WordPress do their update systems, because they use a very similar uh, distro model, very low-end technical solutions for end users to be able to install the software and to update the software without needing uh, necessarily developer skills like being able to use a shell prompt, uh, run curl, run shell commands, things like that. Uh, so I'm going to start off with a little bit of an overview about how did, it, how did we actually get to the end point. I, I'm known for drawing out a lot of my thinking on the whiteboards in my office. This happens to be the whiteboard for when I was doing the planning uh, for this application. Kind of just jotting down thoughts in my mind um, about what steps needed to be taken to actually get the update system working, what issues we might need to overcome, and where within the entire overflow um, certain aspects of the updates needed to take place. Certain things needed to happen uh, at certain points in the execution to get the uh, most efficient update platform. So like most uh, web updatable uh, applications, um, it's a very, very simple workflow. It can be broken down into a few steps. Uh, the actual part where you're checking to make sure the update's actually available, um, if there is one, downloading that package and extracting that package into your file system, uh, getting rid of the existing files as needed, uh, doing your database migrations, and then the finalization within your updates. So something we're doing in Modic uh, that uh, a lot of other open source products don't have necessarily uh, is we have two update paths. Uh, our, our first version of our update code was actually just the command line stuff, and this was actually our first couple of betas that only supported update path. Um, Took a little bit longer, but we did manage to get in the uh, web interface rather quickly using very similar concepts uh, and kind of tweaking uh, some of the stuff that Joomla does for its updates. So long and short is if you're doing the updates through the web interface, you, you have a very similar update screen to what you see in other open source software. Hey, an update's available, here's a new version. Click this button, but before you do, we suggest taking a backup. Um, so to fetch, to fetch updates, uh, there's actually two posts that are sent out from the Modic uh, software when doing the update checks. This first one is, uh, sends some uh, anonymous use statistics uh, up to our uh, stat collection server. Um, and we actually do have that data published on the modic.org website. Um, I don't think it's in the menu structure right now, though. Uh, so we're actually able to make informed decisions uh, based on that uh, anonymous data, and it's the usual PHP, mice, or PHP, the database stuff, because we do support multiple databases, uh, the server operating system, and the current active version of Modic. Um, we do use a little bit of Joomla in our infrastructure. Uh, most of us do have a Joomla background. All of our sites are deployed using Joomla, aside from where we're using Modic, because it's not Joomla, obviously. 
Um, so we actually have a component that we've written specifically to support the update system uh, for Modic. Um, and we can, when we're doing our own releases, we can just very quickly go in here, add our release data, and uh, it pushes out to the uh, remote of Modic sites. As far as the updates go, um, we use a standalone application, and it's actually a very simple procedural-based uh, file. Uh, and the gist of it is basically on the screen here. Um, there's four or five steps that are involved in the uh, updates from outside of the application. Uh, and this basically sums up the instantiation and routing of that standalone application. By the time all said and done, we get back in the application, we're handling our database migrations as needed, um, and we do a little bit of finalization. We do support translations, so we handle any uh, language updates that are needed in this step. We do a little bit of cleanup of the uh, infrastructure that our update code actually downloads. There's some stuff that our update system creates in the file system specifically for updates, then we'll go ahead and clean it up here. So getting into the uh, nitty gritty, a little bit of the technical details now. Um, so this first little screen cap, I know some of these aren't gonna be readable, but it's uh, more to demonstrate workflow than necessarily understanding the code. Um, we're actually using native PHP uh, zip archive class. Uh, we're only doing zip archives. We're not trying to support multiple uh, archive uh, types. Um, so we're using that native PHP class, which actually it's pretty performant. Uh, it's pretty decent when it comes to performance. Uh, it has a pretty good error checking system in place. Um, so actually, this big bulk up here is all the error handling stuff. And the actual, actual extract code is that little bit on the bottom. Um, and our update system is using, for the web interface, uh, it's all AJAX driven. We're breaking it down into a lot of small steps uh, to get a, as performant, uh, optimize performance as possible and to avoid some of those resource issues that you can run into uh, when you're working with these web type applications. Um, so just for reference, when I talk about this uh, standalone update code, uh, it's actually all in GitHub. Uh, the URL to it is on the slide there. I use, I use uh, code from that, or I use uh, sample snippets from that file all throughout the presentation. So feel free if you're on your phones or your laptops to kind of read through it and get an idea for yourself. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, this standalone update file, it's all procedural PHP code. It's not anything fancy. fancy. In fact, it's pretty much pure PHP. Uh, it was an intentional decision to keep it isolated from any of the application architecture. Um, which, which did mean it took a little bit longer to create some of these things because um, for example, PHP doesn't have a native way to recursively delete, delete directories, and that's something that uh, JFolder has within its API. So a little bit of copying, a little bit of tweaking to make things fit our infrastructure. Um, another one of the things that's uh, being shown on uh, the slide here uh, is how we're breaking things down into small steps. Um, so we, we are composer-based, so we do have a vendor folder, and then um, kind of comparable to Joomla extensions, we use Symfony's bundles uh, structure to split out the different pieces of the application, as well as support uh, add-ons from third parties. Um, so for the core supported stuff, uh, we basically uh, do some loops uh, and only, well, all right, so at this point actually the uh, updated code has already been extracted to the file system. And we actually extract it into a temp folder. We don't overwrite the existing file system like Joomla does. Uh, this was actually something that was suggested by one of Symfony's lead devs uh, as kind of a fail-safe option. Um, so at this point, what we're doing is we're iterating over our resources that are in the update system to move over everything into the production code. Uh, and like I said, it's doing it in very small chunks to be performant. Um, so we basically max out for our vendor folder and our bundles at a total of five top level folders per iteration. Uh, and then we just keep looping the requests. We use an update state and pass some parameters between each request uh, to track this data, track our spot, as well as do file system checks through each request just to make sure that things are still there. Um, I mentioned earlier that we do manage things in the file system, such as deleted files. Um, 
something that we do that Joomla doesn't is we manage the deleted files uh, within the standalone application. If you're doing Joomla updates, those old files don't get deleted until you're back in the CMS application going through a CMS request. Uh, and this has actually caused some issues in the past when we've moved around some of the classes in the file system uh, and the old versions getting loaded when the system's expecting the new version. So to completely get away from that with our own code, we decided to manage the, uh, the uh, deleted files within this uh, standalone application. During packaging, uh, the, and this is actually similar to Joomla's packaging script, uh, we, we iterate over the git diff uh, between the two tags, figure out what files are modified and deleted, and we add in a deleted files uh, text file that has a, uh, has a JSON list of all the files that get deleted and need to be removed out of the file system. And uh, this step of the update will actually take care of that. Um, another little thing we do at each step, uh, because we're not really keeping a session uh, necessarily, the update state is uh, kind of tracking some other stuff, but it's unrelated to this. Uh, we do have some error logging built into our uh, standalone update app. Uh, so at every step, uh, we basically check uh, whether that step logged any errors, and if so, we write those errors out to a file. Um, something we actually missed in the UI right now is uh, putting some kind of notification if we write that file saying, hey, there might have been an error, go ahead and check this. Uh, and it's logging everything, basically. If we, we couldn't copy a file, if we couldn't uh, delete a file or delete a folder, in a lot of cases, it's not going to be disruptive to the site, uh, especially given the way that Symfony is structured. Um, but we do write, we do write all those items uh, just as a courtesy and to say, hey, you know, here, here's a list of everything that had issues. Uh, if it failed to copy over, uh, it should, if it, if the uh, update temp path is still there, you should be able to copy it manually. If not, you can get it out of the zip package. Uh, if it was something that needed to be deleted, but it wasn't automatically, you're safe to delete it. We, we handle uh, database migrations. Um, as a Symfony app, we're using Doctrine. Uh, so we're using Doctrine's migrations library. Uh, we did a little bit of tweaking to its infrastructure because we are supporting uh, multiple database platforms um, to kind of optimize it for our, um, our own needs. Uh, for the most part, that class is purely uh, the database uh, migrations between versions. Uh, occasionally, we've had to throw in something that's very specific purpose, and we don't have any other place um, in the application structure to actually do it. So the Doctrine Migrations class has kind of took on an additional uh, responsibility for migrations as a whole, but it's still within that migration scope. Um, if you're familiar with Doctrine Migrations library, it actually does support downgrades. Um, it's not something that we've actually implemented in our own code, though. Uh, so. I mentioned earlier that we do support translations. We actually do have a, a pretty healthy team of translators. We use TransFX as our hub. Um, we don't actually support the notion of tagged and versioned language packages. Uh, what we actually do on the back end uh, is we have, we have a, a, a cron job running on our Jenkins instance. Uh, every 24 hours, it pulls the latest data out of TransFX and creates new packages. Uh, and implements that data into our uh, modic.org data system. Um, and then uh, the modic instances, when they ping up, when they ping for updates, they also get that updated language list back. So if a new language has been added since the last update, it immediately shows uh, in the language option list. Uh, and we actually, if, so if you're changing languages in modic and you don't have the language that's in the list actually locally installed, uh, it goes ahead and installs it on the fly. And then during updates, it automatically updates every language that you have in place. So you're not updating several individual packages at once. Uh, so some of the challenges that we deal with, because we are a Symfony application and they have a very development-oriented uh, development workflow, whereas, uh, like I've harped on a couple of times now, we're aiming for a less technical uh, workflow. Uh, so one of the big things is Symfony ha makes use heavily uh, of a caching system. Uh, and this is actually a snapshot of uh, the cache folder for a production uh, deployment. Um, and in there, you see a lot of caching for the routing system, the compiled translations, 
uh, and uh, all the stuff for doctrine. We're actually kind of shifting some of the doctrine stuff around to be less cash dependent. Um, but, but the main point here is Symphony he heavily relies on that stuff. And when you're making changes such as application updates or uh, global configuration updates, you have to be able to clear out some of that stuff. Even with the language updates, we actually have to be able to do a little bit of clearing just on the translation cache specifically. Um, so in the standalone update app, we actually just completely wipe out the cache folder. Uh, Symphony, it, will re it rebuilds that cache on the first web request if it's not there. Um, command line, there's actually a console command to take care of it. It's more efficient because it also goes ahead and, and rebuilds that cache uh, based on the existing data structure. Um, so there is a small performance hit on the first request after uh, the cache is deleted anytime we do it in the application structure. Um, but it's generally unnoticeable, especially when you're on an AJAX screen that's looping over and over. We do work around uh, potential resource limits. We, since we are aiming for a lower technical resource, we do have uh, support for shared hosting where things may not be as optimized as you'd like. So we purposely broke down the update system into small chunks that so that we aren't hitting resources and we have a lot of leeway left to actually restructure if we wanted to uh, make some of those requests handle more at one spot. Another benefit of this is we're also requiring less memory during each of the update steps. Um, I know it's another unreadable slide, but it's but this is a uh, this is a screen cap of all of the requests that get sent during an update loop. Um, so this last request right here. And the first three requests at the very top are actually within the application structure. Um, we actually do have to download and extract the, the uh, zip package from within the application. Um, and our update application is actually not left in the file system. Uh, it's only packaged in our update script, and it's re removed as soon as the update is finished. So it actually also gives us a little lee leeway to uh, refactor within the update script and not have to deal with uh, compatibility concerns aside from uh, the URL routing from within the app. Uh, so that middle chunk of, I think it was 15 requests, uh, is actually all the steps for uh, moving over the files, clearing out the cache, uh, and just getting just getting the file system reset for the next update. And all in all, this is actually a 13-second process. Most of those requests in the in the middle there are 200 milliseconds, 250 milliseconds max. So it's very very quick and efficient. Dealing with uh, extracting zip packages is never an is never an easy thing. Um, Symphony itself doesn't have a native API to deal with extracting this stuff. Uh, we looked at Joomla's API, but it, it really only deals with, um, was it building or extracting? I, I don't remember again. But I know that the archive API isn't fully featured. And in, at the end of the day, it actually just seemed like a little bit of bloatware uh, com compared to what we were aiming to accomplish. Uh, so we, we lo did look into the native PHP API and see what issues there might have been with uh, actually just using that. And I think it has a dependency on PHP's uh, zip extension or something, but if you don't have that installed on the host, you've got a load of other issues anyway. So that was pretty much a safe bet to go ahead and use that API. Uh, and like I highlighted on that slide, it has a pretty decent error checking system built into it. Um, so it actually enabled us to build a, a more error-redundant uh, uh, system. We do support web and command line updates, as I mentioned before. And there are some, there are some tweaks uh, between what the web update system does compared to the command line update system. Since it's on command line, you have, you have a little bit more leeway with uh, resource usage, memory limits, things like that. Um, so one of the things we actually do is we don't extract the zip package to a temp folder and then move everything over. We just extract in place. Uh, we also go ahead and deal with the deleted file thing uh, within that command line script. Uh, I mentioned the cache handling stuff a few slides ago, too. We go ahead and run uh, Symfony's uh, uh, cache clear console command to go ahead and nuke the cache and uh, rebuild it the proper way. Uh, and, and since we are uh, within that command line interface, uh, running doctrine migrations is a little bit more native. 
Um, the, our, our website proxies into the console command through Symfony's API, but it's a little easier to do it, uh, do trigger another command line uh, command from the console versus trying to do it web proxying to command line. Uh, and you don't need as many processes to do it, obviously. Uh, this create this ends up running 18, 19 requests on a, a web interface, whereas it's just one consistently running process on the command line. We do have some debug tools built into the update system, too, uh, so that we could use them. Uh, I mentioned our update state a little bit ago. This is just an encoded array, basically, passed between requests. Um, but if we ever actually did need to debug stuff with users, in, then we could get them to go through their logs and uh, get this data out. And it actually, it's actually helped with uh, addressing a very, uh, very unique uh, edge case with the update code a couple of releases ago. Uh, since we also have the error logs, we can have a, we can get a, a more we can get a more efficient idea if an update were to fail, where it failed at, and what issues uh, need to be addressed. So the title of this is called Lessons Learned from Joomla. But the reality is we learned a few lessons from open source. Um, myself and David Hurley, we've got a pretty good uh, relationship with Andy Nason from WordPress. Uh, so while we were all at a conference last year, we picked his brain for a little bit about uh, some of the architecture for WordPress's updates, uh, including their, including their uh, stat collection data. Uh, at that same conference, we also got the chance to talk to a couple of uh, Symphony's lead devs to pick their brains and get some ideas. So all in all, we were able to use uh, a lot of open source knowledge to build an efficient platform for ourselves. Um, so one of the things that this is more something I wanted to do than necessarily uh, something learned from open source, but supporting multiple update paths. Um, I personally think that doing updates of an application from the command line or in a context that's isolated from that application is actually more efficient than trying to update the application using that application. Uh, and, I, and that shows with Joomla when we hit those unique edge cases like the issue with the Remember Me plugin and not having the application object in it or earlier 3X releases when we, were trans, when we moved the file system around and the, the J application class wasn't found at the right place. Uh, so, doing this, so doing these things from both web and command line, we built an interface that um, it, it's efficient for both, uh, and it gets around uh, some of the issues that we've seen. And uh, like I said, generally command line is going to be more reliable for what we're trying to do, and it's actually something I'd love to see in Joomla one day. We were able to optimize the updates based on the things we learned. Uh, in Joomla, we're just extracting the zip package from the temp folder right into the file system. It's, there's no extract and then move into place. Um, so there's no real way of catching uh, if a file didn't move over correctly or, or something like that. Um, and we don't have that logging system in, in, well, all right, let me take that back. Joomla does have a little bit of update logging, but it's not really all that detailed. It logs all of the executed queries that are run during the request cycle, but it doesn't catch any of the file system errors. Um, so ha having those logging resources in place actually uh, is a step forward. It, and it gives devs a tool to troubleshoot with, gives users the information the devs need, and just makes a more optimized uh, workflow for everybody. We're passing data back and forth. We are collecting usage statistics just specifically on um, you know, the things that we need to make decisions. So having, the, having that data actually helps us justify the decisions we make. Um, very early on, we actually asked if it was worth supporting SQLite. It's something that Doctrine supports out of the box. Uh, so in theory, our code was supporting it. Uh, but there was, through our through our early access uh, beta stuff, there was no use there was no use data at all coming in from SQLite. So we went ahead and dropped support for it. Um, we want to drop Microsoft support because it's Microsoft, and none of us seem to have Windows systems. <laughs> But uh, there, there's actually a very small uh, percentage of users that are using the Microsoft uh, database platform. In fact, if I remember right, it's actually a little bit larger than the PostgreSQL uh, user base, MySQL still being the top one because it's more widely available. 
bottom line up front is we're not guessing wildly. We know how many users are on PHP 5.3 versus 5.6. We know what databases they're in use. We know if users are up to date or if they're still running older versions. Uh, it's not data that we have in Joomla. Um, and it's something that we really wanted based on what we saw in WordPress. And actually, one of the lengthy discussions that we had with uh, Andy Nason was about how to manage uh, that stat collection. Uh, one of the things that we were early on concerned with was the integrity of that data and folks spamming it and putting false data into it and just making it an unreliable data source. Um, bottom line up front from them was basically they don't have real strict uh, integrity checks. Uh, they're just collecting the data. They're not worried about uh, recycling out stale records. They're not worried about... Uh, whether false data is getting injected in, because it's very obvious when you see it. You can very quickly filter it out. Um, so it, it actually relaxed us a little bit about building the, the uh, stat collection API that we have, uh, just so we weren't focusing so much on uh, these details. And we isolated the update application. Um, everything that we can do outside of the application is done outside the application moving files around in the file system, making sure that classes don't get, don't get overwritten mid-cycle, uh, and, and, and having it uh, isolated from any vendor dependencies, a pure PHP procedural implementation. Um, so, it, it, yeah, it's not object-oriented API, so those of you that are pure object-oriented API people, whatever. But it gets the job done. It's actually a good representation of procedural code, I think. Um, and at the end of the day, it's moving that business logic that doesn't need to be in the application stack to a location where it, it's more better uh, served. Uh, and with that, that's all the notes I have. We still got a few minutes, so if you got questions, Mm -hmm. We're not. Okay. All right. So the question was, um, how, how do we deal with those poorly configured hosts where Joomla's FTP layer comes into play? Uh, and the answer is, we're not. Uh, we're we're using Symfony's native API within the application for uh, for any file system type things, uh, and then our a standalone application is native PHP. We aren't trying to deal with FTP things. So that, that is something that we aren't doing. We don't have plans to do. Uh, but I do see how it makes sense for Joomla, and it's something that would need to be considered if you wanted to go this route of ab abstracting more of that update logic out of the application and into a standalone resource. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. I won't keep you from snacking if you want to, really. <laughs> That's something that has to make you in the head. What's that? I don't, I don't know the raw data off the top of my head, but uh, I want to say it's like up to 10% of the tracked installs are non-MySQL. Mo, mo, there's more Microsoft than Postgres, but there are, there are a fair number of non-MySQL installs. I can tell you that 25% of the user base is PHP 5.3, uh, and actually breaking it down more, most of that is the 5.3.29 release. Uh, a couple of them are on those Linux uh, LTS distros. Yeah, uh, I want to say our biggest chunk right now is 5.4, which is still okay since it's supported. Um, and then 5.5 and 5.6 gradually decline, obviously. The one thing I do wish that we had, but because we're not on the Doctrine version that has that API yet, 
is specific uh, database versions because there are differences in features between MySQL 5.0 and 5.5, Postgres 9.0, 9.2, things like that. So once we're able to uh, update our doctrine uh, API to the version that has the API endpoint to extract the version, then we're already coded to receive that data. We just need to send it. Well, thank you. <laughs>